Good. Yeah. I've, I've been watching you. It looks like you're you're blowing and going. Well, thank you, man. Thank you very much. And hey, it looks like you are too, John. It looks like you are too. I'm sitting here looking at the email addresses and looking at the websites and uh, looking at all the things that you've got going on. Now, I know we've spoke before. However, uh, there's a lot of listeners and a lot of viewers out there now that weren't there then. Would mm -hmm. you like to uh, give a, 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 and be thorough, give a, a description of who you are and what you do in this space today? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to, Christopher. Yeah, thanks again for reconnecting with me. It's been a little a little bit since we met back in the fall, I guess. So my background is uh, out of Austin, Texas. Actually, I went to middle school and high school in San Antonio. So I was, uh, after high school, went brief stint in the military and settled in Austin, where I began a long career in the financial planning and retirement income space. Ended up growing my company and selling it in March of 2021 to a law firm in Michigan, gave me a big chunk of money. And so it was COVID. I bought a motor home. We traveled, my wife and I, 17 states, looking at what's called opportunity zone locations. And uh, that's a new tax incentive, basically came out of 27 tax code, uh, what they call it, Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And it's similar to 1031 exchange, but it's a lot broader, sure. basically. It's an incentive to get people to invest in other low-income census tracts they might have otherwise overlooked. Sure. Ended up buying a property in the hotel district in Rockport down on the coast near San Antonio. San Antonio's have a, a keen affiliation with Rockport. Certainly. It, there was a time 100-plus uh, years ago there were three passenger trains a day from San Antonio to Rockport, if you can imagine. Isn't that that says it's such a destination for San Antonio in particular. That's certainly a lot of folks for sure. Certainly a lot of folks for sure that are traveling back and forth. Now I knew it used to be a, a, a premier tourist destination. I mean, you got to think about as far as away as it is, we've got a coast, you know, that's the coast of an ocean that we have. And it's only two hours away, something like that. Yeah. That's two laptops. Sure, sure, sure. That, that's beautiful. So I can totally understand why somebody in this area would want to, uh, you know, invest in an area like that. Okay. So I was, I was telling you, we, we traveled and looked at these opportunity zone locations and and ended up deploying some capital, buying a couple properties here in, in Rockport because it's a bit of an anomaly. It's so many second homeowners here that have homes primarily in San Antonio, Austin, throughout the Hill Country, and even Houston. So it's kind of, you had to be in the lowest income census tract. So it's kind of an anomaly that the, the residents here who report their incomes tend to be retired or low income. So it's a unique situation that I capitalized on. Now that's been a couple of years. I've been here, be three years in July. And I've launched now, I'm focused on setting up a new regulation crowdfunding offering for non-accredited investors to invest in, in real estate in Texas via what's known as tax deed sales. And I'll go into that a little bit more, you know, with you in detail, but that's kind of real exciting to me. I've got 30 plus years experience in this space. I know it really well, and it's a, a great opportunity right now to, to buy tax deed properties all over the state of Texas. So tell us a little about that. What is buying a tax deed or buying a tax deed property? Just for those out there that don't have any idea what it is and have never heard about it, what does that even mean? Okay. So Texas is very unique, but all states, if you don't pay your property taxes, uh, because property tax support the schools, the county, the cities, you know, it's, it's how local governments operate. And it's a very high priority lien on the property. It's higher than the mortgage, for example. If there are other liens and the property goes into foreclosure and gets sold at the, uh, for back taxes, all other liens are extinguished, wiped out, number one. I see. Because of the importance of the property tax. Now, Texas is unique because we're what's called a redeemable tax deed state. If you lose your property at a tax sale, then you have what's called a right of redemption. If it's not a homestead property, it's a six-month, 180-day window from the sale where you can redeem your property, but you have to pay what was 
uh, the, the amount that the property sold for plus a 25% penalty if it's redeemed in the first 180 days, as long as it's not homestead or ag exempt or mineral right property. Now, those type of properties have a two-year, much longer redemption period. But back to the basics, other states, they sell liens where investors buy a lien and they earn so much interest anywhere from as little as 1% to 24%, depending on the state. Sure. Texas, Texas is unique, Chris, because we don't buy liens. We buy a deed. It's called a sheriff's deed. I see. I can go into more or yeah. Oh yeah, no, no. Go into depth exactly what this is. I know that there's going to be people out there who want to follow it. What is he even talking about? How does this work? Why, why, why would I want to go into this? Uh, do I even understand what that means? So sure, yes, by all means. I mean, uh, you mentioned screen sharing as well. You certainly can. I can give you the permissions while you're talking, uh, okay. so that we can do all of that. But yeah, go on ahead. Go, feel free to keep on trucking, bud. I may pop up something up here in just a little bit, but let me go back over the basics. The importance of ad valorem property taxes and why it's such a high priority lien. This is what pays the schools, you know, pays for our, our streets, utilities, cities, counties. In Austin, we had uh, college, ACC, Austin Community College, sure. levy tax. Down here on the coast, there's what's called navigation districts. Mm -hmm. They levy tax. And so, People, many of the properties that we buy are not homestead. We don't want people who are living in the homes. We're looking for properties that are second homes, commercial properties, raw land is our niche. I see. I see. Okay. So you're not looking for, for, you know, grandma and grandpa's house. You're looking for a larger piece of property that can be used for commercial, preferably, or maybe a piece of land that can be developed or, uh, right, or a vacation home that's that's ready to go that you can use for rental property or or something. So, I, okay, right for cash flow purposes, I got you. Uh, uh, now, homestead properties do go on the auction every month in Texas. We have two hundred fifty four counties. Every county holds a tax sale, and by state statute, it, the sale is conducted at ten a.m. on the first Tuesday of the month. So every month there's a tax sale and uh, about a third of the counties have a sale every month and at 10 a.m. the first Tuesday and people show up. I remember the first tax sale I went to in, in 1993, there was only two of us at the sale. There was 13 properties. It was myself and I'm green, didn't know anything and, and a very established attorney and we end up buying everything. I bought three properties. He bought 10. That's <laughs> opening bid. We didn't bid up the prices. But now there's so many people at these sales, they bid the prices up. And sometimes they're uneducated or they don't really do their diligence and they pay more than they should for the property. Certainly. It's very competitive. What's really got me excited recently is the trend now in Texas to move away from online at the court. I'm sorry, from live sales at the courthouse step to online sales. Sure, that was my next question. Uh, I think what you're describing is something that we've we've all heard about, you know, that there's the auction at the courthouse steps, you know, every, every week or every month or what have you, and you've got to be there and there's a ton of people and it's a lot of competition. And if you don't have enough money and if you're not right, the right player, uh, that there's all these, you know, little politics and, and you know, game pieces that go into play. And uh, I think that's what scares a lot of people off of this. So, you're telling me that there have been some changes in, in the real estate world. You're telling me that in this world that you now do not have to go that route. Tell me more. Okay. So not all the counties have transitioned over to online auctions. However, it is a trend and it's becoming more and more popular. About a third of the counties, so somewhere around 90 or so, are doing it online. And what, what's kind of nice about that is you can be in more than one auction a month at 10 a.m., but really what my company now is doing the heavy lifting. We're doing the diligence. We're looking at the property. We're doing all the underwriting. And we've, we've created a offering that allows as little as $2,000 non-accredited investors can own a piece of real estate in Texas. Are you kidding me? For $2,000? Minimum 2000 and they're what's called a class A partner in the investment. 
we're wow. not we're, we're not yet ready to accept any money from the public i have to give this big disclaimer sure we're under what's called regulation crowdfunding regulation cf and it's a long drawn up legal process and we're allowed to to take right now what's called like reservations or non-binding pledges sure okay so okay. a soft commitment right exactly all right so this is the soft pledge landing page invest.coretaxdeeds.com we're a hundred percent focused on texas only right now we may scale up in another year or so expand to two other states georgia and uh georgia and tennessee okay those are the three states that that their laws are similar to Texas that have what's called redeemable tax deeds. Sure. So okay. this video here on this page, and again, we're under what's called test the water stage, where you, we can't accept any any money if, if someone was ready. Right. There's what we call slide deck here. You know, I mentioned Texas, Georgia, and Tennessee. These three states are what's called redeemable deeds. Hmm. Let me go back into a little more detail on that. Sure, please do. For example, we've been on a property in Aransas County this month, February the 5th. And it was a vacant lot in on the water in Copano Bay, worth about $140,000. I did some research. Of course, I went and looked at the property. I have three partners who are in the field going to these properties so we never buy anything unless we put our eyes on it first of all it could be a house that burned down a week before the auction we don't even know so we definitely want to so the high bidder on that property paid like twelve thousand dollars and the former owner is has a six month period where they can come back and pay that price twelve thousand plus a 25 percent penalty and, re and reclaim re-ownership the high bidder, us, now is the owner. We can collect rents. We can put a roof. We can maintain the property. We can't improve it. We can't upgrade it. But if we do anything to keep it in good repair, the penalty applies to all the money we have spent on the property, et cetera. We get what's called a, a sheriff's deed without warranty. You can't lose. The only way you can lose is if we bought property with environmental problems, uh, if there was, you know, uh, a property that wasn't worth what we paid. Sure. Something that slipped past due diligence. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's why you do do the due diligence. Now, you know what? That's a word that a lot of folks don't understand. Would you like to explain exactly what due diligence means when it comes to acquisitions, when it comes to, uh, to, uh, this type, you know, the purchases that you make? Oh yeah. Happy. Yeah, and possibly maybe even the criteria that you use. Yeah, so they don't post these properties very much in advance. You only have about a three-week window each month to start uh, doing your diligence. So first step is, and by the way, I'm happy to teach people if they're inclined to do the heavy listing and go do this on their own, more power to them. Our market is for people who don't have the time or the desire, but to have what's called a passive desire to own some real estate and potentially participate in the upside when we sell it. Certainly. So diligence, your question, Chris, we identify, uh, first we look at the uh, records at the courthouse, the suit that was filed. There's three law firms that tend to dominate this market in Texas. One is based in Round Rock called McCrary Vaselka. The largest one is based in Austin. They're called Limebarger. Uh, couple other names, Limebarger and Associates. So they bring suit against the property owner. Typically, there's two years of delinquent taxes past due. Once they file suit, it's another five to seven months, the judicial process to sure. bring it to courthouse steps. So property owners have had ample time if they're able to or want to. Many of them, okay. these, these, Chris, are not even worth the opening bid. Sure. People just let them go. Uh yeah. And so, of course, you want to stay away from paying more than something's worth. <laughs> certainly, certainly, right. certainly. 
Okay, so so basically just doing due diligence is doing your homework. That's what that means. It just means doing your homework, going and checking it out, looking at it, seeing the property, and making sure that it is what you think it is, you know. You look at comps, look at the neighborhood, look at the exit strategy, sure. and uh, see what, what, what our maximum bid we're going to bid up to. If right. If someone wants to pay more, let them have it. Exactly right. And that that comes into your own investment criteria is like, how much do we put in? How much do we want to put in against this asset? Uh, what do we believe we could recover from it? You know, what makes sense to us? Uh, stuff like that. So, OK, so that's kind of what it is that you do. You and your company, you guys go and you find these deals. And that's really the majority of your work, right? It's out there deal hunting, like finding just the right one to make sure that your that your fund and your investors are get the, the most upside possible. I mean, that's what you all want is the most growth and, and growth potential uh, possible. So tell me now, you mentioned something that to me uh, and I believe my audience, uh, it was was kind of riveting, really. $2,000 can get you into something like this. I mean, I know that's not a lot of an investment. Now, on starting out at that level, if that's all you could scrape together, you got your income tax in and you, you don't want to just burn through it. So you say, hey, I want to make it a real investment. Now, what type of return or, or is kind of expected that they're looking for? And what type of distribution plan do you have worked out for this fund? Okay, here's how it's structured. That's a good question. Um we are setting it up where I have a management entity and it's called Tax Deed Investors. That's myself and three other partners who have put in capital between 25 and 50,000. Just to kind of get us up legal and accounting, we, we have audited financials. And so that's the startup money. And then the other investors are called Class A members. I refer to them as limited partners, but technically they're class A members sure. and they get what's called a 12% preferred return Ah, okay. So on your investment. Um, the first money to come out, it goes back to the class A investors at 12%. Once we have profits to distribute, we split the profits 60, 40, the limited class A investors get 60% of the profits my management team gets 40% of the profits. Okay. Once, once the investors are made whole, once you get the return of your capital, then we go to a 50-50 split from then on. Okay. We're, gonna raise as, we're allowed to raise as much as $5 million. My goal is to raise $1.2 million uh, this year, 2024. And we have some incentives, some bonus shares if people come in at two different thresholds. If they come in at 15000 we, we give them an additional 5% of shares. And then if they come in at 50,000, they get additional 10% shares. Oh, so okay. It's not, it's not uh, something that high net worth people and accredited investors will, will shy away from. They're welcome and we want them to invest, but we really want to design this where the average person with just a minimal amount of capital and willing to take us some risk, you know, there's risk with everything. Uh, but the upside 12% is a preferred return and then 60% of the profits. And for example, my pro forma shows on our initial purchase of 3.8 million in properties will have a net a value of 17 million. We're wanting to buy around 30 cents on the value, 30 cents on the dollar. Sure. And after six months, we sell at wholesale at 70 cents on the dollar. I see. We don't want to hold the properties and hold out for the retail or market sure. value. We want to turn and make profits and, and grow. Another kind of a cool component we have is when we get beyond the redemption period, whether it's six months or two years, because we will buy some homestead by accident or, you know, just can't turn it down. It's a great buy. Sure. Or, or um, We'll buy something with a mineral right or an ag exempt, some acreage that's got an ag exempt. Those people have a two-year right of redemption. If they redeem it in the second year, they have to pay us what we paid plus 50% interest penalty. I see. Can't lose either way. But the step up, I mean, the uh, the higher investor is going to get a little bit of a bonus for risking a little more capital, basically. Sure. 
Certainly, certainly, yeah. More risk, more reward. I mean, that's that's the way that goes. That's the way that game's played. It's like you want a better percentage rate, put in some more money. I mean, you know, or, or let us hold it longer. I mean, uh, that's the only way those plans work out. That makes sense to me right now. So now I've got to ask, uh, the, the numbers sound all right on 12% and 60% and then a 50% after you're paid off. Uh, what type of estimated break even are you looking at? Yeah, I mean, I know that's hard to say, and there's nothing definitive here. You know, believe me, there's nothing definitive that you're saying. Uh, well, I mean, that's the way that's the investment world, but I also know that you've done your homework, you've put together a financial plan, you've done a break even analysis, you have an idea of how long it's going to take before you know your average investor would be covered. So, can you give me an idea of what that looks like? Yep, happy to. Uh, once we go over that, I want to show you my track record in this space. Heck yes. So, uh, that's what this next slide refers to. But we anticipate the break even is short of 18 months. You'll have all your capital back. It's not guaranteed. There's no promises. Sure. But based on uh, my experience and our criteria, buying right and selling at wholesale, we believe we can return the principal back to where people are whole by 18 months or less. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's great. I mean, I don't think that's too far for, for a whole lot of folks, to, you know, to uh, get a 12% return on, you know, so. Yeah, right. I'm backed up by the, the dirt, the property, you know, they have ownership interest like all of us in each property we acquire. Sure. Sure. Now, right. Yeah, I'm ready to get on with your next slide. Sorry about that. I, I hate to keep holding you up. Actually, I'm ready to get through the slide deck so I can get back to main screen and look at your your uh, beautiful bald head, just like this one right here. <laughs> Thank you. So I bought 47 properties in my career at tax sales, primarily Travis County, Austin. Um, the first one I mentioned, 1993. I bought three properties. Let's see if there's any of those on this list. Yeah, this Eisenhower, I paid $1,277, sold it for $22,000. That's a huge RIA. I've had, I've had more successful wins that my legal team said, don't put it on here. It just, I mean, you don't want to set that bar so high. But I don't. I can share with you. It's a fact. I have it all documented. I paid eleven hundred dollars for a lot on a corner, and uh, sold it to the Catholic Church next door. I paid eleven hundred some change. Sold it for. So, YouTube Analytics tells me that eighty-six percent of you guys are not subscribed. Let's change that. Hit the button. Thirty-eight thousand. So those are you know. I'm I'm not allowed to they they sure. they recommend I do put the big winners on here, but these are uh, average uh properties showing average you know, returns. Sure, yeah. average returns. Because of course there are the exponential ones, the ones that you got in on a heck of a deal. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure they happen more often than people would think, especially when you're in the business every day and that's your job is hunting for it. Uh I totally understand that and uh and you know and get that. Uh, so that's, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons that people find value in putting in uh, an investment into a fund like this is they don't have to learn the industry. They don't have to go hunt the properties. They don't have to find the deals. They don't have to buy, uh, get the contractors and, and the lawyers and the team together and the accountants and any of that. All they really have to do is to come out of pockets, unass some cash and, uh, and, and wait and get their distribution. So uh, now that's another question I've got to ask. Uh, what type of, well, you already, you already said it. How often are the distribution uh, payments scheduled or is that just at certain percentages? Quarterly. Okay. Great, we'll, great. We'll distribute quarterly once we have profits. Right, right, right. All right, well, carry on, good sir. Okay. I did want to mention of the 47 properties I've acquired in my career, only three have been redeemed. So that's less than 10%. And that goes to speak to the fact that we're not primarily buying uh, homestead owner-occupied properties. I think those, there's a much higher redemption period when you do buy that that type of business model. Sure, we sure. We want to end up with the dirt. 25% in six months is, is great. That's effectively a 50% first year yield. And it's applicable if they redeem the property in the first week or the fifth month. It's a flat 25% penalty. Wow. By state statute. So we've got, you know, the full government backing. 
Yeah, you yeah. got a 25% upside no matter what. Yeah, as long as you don't buy a, a, a pig and a poke. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. The, so another thing about the hard work that we're doing with the underwriting in the field and all the legal research, the comps, that sort of thing, is about half of the property will get pooled or paid at the last minute and not even be available. So we've spent our time researching, spend money, actual dollars and time researching properties that we may not even have a chance on to bid on because one way or another, they get pooled. They're called, that's the technical term, most likely got paid. The property owner somehow found the money at the last minute to pay the taxes. Great. But the point is people don't enjoy spending money doing work on property and not even, it's just part of business. You may not get a chance to even bid on it. 50% or so, more or less, you know, it varies. We'll get pulled before the auction begins at 10 a.m. on the first Tuesday of the month. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's just so that's another kind of, That's another, yeah, kind of a pushback. Now, here's our website. I don't know if my screen changed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it looks great. Thanks. Cool so text. Lots to learn here on the website. Uh, if someone's interested or happy to take any calls at some point in time, text or email. Now, if uh, they can't see that on the screen uh, when they go to watch this, the uh, address is corefundsii.com. Okay, so it's Core Funds 2, right? That's or Core right. Fund, uh, it's singular. So corefundii.com. Uh, if you want to look at it, and there will be a link down in the description, but if you want to check it out without going there, that's what it is. It, it's it's corefundii.com. So now tell us more about uh, about the website and everything you got going on here, John. Okay, so we actually changed our name and why the, the Core Fund 2 is okay. called the domain. Eventually, they're going to have it rerouted correctly where the domain is coretaxdeeds.com. That's the website that will be up soon. <laughs> I say, okay, okay. I can... Either way, we'll have the correct link in the description when you get it to me. <laughs> correct. And this just gives information about my team. I'm really excited to have an, a very experienced real estate attorney and a tax attorney on my advisory board and as an investor. Excellent. He's a 40-year tax and real estate attorney in Austin. His name's Bruce Morrison. I've known him for 25 years. He's put in the most cash into our, our management team. But more than that, he brings a lot of credibility when it comes to real estate. He's got a lot of connections. His father was a professor of law at the University of Texas from 1947 to 1977. Wow. So Bruce, our investor partner, manager on the team, you know, he's up in age. But think of it. His father, he's been in around legal practicing law all his life, basically. Certainly. And I also have a securities attorney on my advisory board. We have two field underwriters that are out in the field going to the live auctions. And they're longtime friends of mine who also have skin in the game, minimum 25,000. Sure. And we have a, another lady investor who's helping us on the management team with all the data compilation. Her name is Bridget. Happy to have her. And she's hey. actually used some of her uh, IRA money to invest and it's eligible for self-directed IRA. Excellent. If someone, someone wants to learn more about that, I'm happy to help them. I tell you, John, the name of this show is the network of net worth. The reason that we put this show together is to help you build your network, right? They help you figure out or not figure out, but they help you find the people that you're looking for. And when I say the people that you're looking for, I mean, clientele right who are you looking for as a customer what's what's your number one type of person that you want to come and do business with you number two uh professionally who do you want to know is there a certain type of person like you, you're really excited to have this new attorney uh and to have the you know the team members that you've got on are there any other team members that you're looking for that maybe somebody yeah. in the audience could could reach out to you and say hey this is what i do john I'd love to talk to you more about it. Yes. In fact, we're uh, looking for something called a fractional CFO to help with all the uh, 
the financial accounting that sort of thing so that's that's one one space we're we're looking for okay and there'll be others but right now that comes to mind as, as one of our immediate needs you're looking for a fractional cf or cfo now what is the difference between a cfo and a fractional cfo if you don't mind my asking i, I don't know yeah so a fractional just spends part of their time on our project whereas a, a full cfo they're you know they're like four times the cost but they're 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 part of your exclusive. They're like more along the lines of a full time. Sure, uh, I get what you're saying. So this guy's going to be more of an advisory position. He's going to oversee stuff, make sure the checks is and bal or checks and balances are done at the end of the day. And uh, you know he's not having to spend all his time on it. You guys can handle the most part. It's just to make sure that you stay as compliant as possible. Uh, I see yeah, what you're we saying. Have a, we have an accounting firm that's handling our 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 compilations of all of our bookkeeping and then we have a firm that is uh doing the tax filings sure. but what we do and i have an auditing company out of florida that's very slow very expensive <laughs> but it's required to have our financials audited right. even though we don't have a big track record i mean right. this, this company and i'm still waiting that's what's holding us up filing the form c with the sec right now is the audit the audit that's being performed. And, and I was going to ask you, what exactly is that? What do they audit? I mean, with when you're just launching, what is there to audit? Well, we had three months worth of, uh, of, of they're auditing from startup October to end of year, 2023. And there's not a whole lot of entries, but it, they, they do background checks, bad actor checks. Be sure, you know, you're, you're on up and ups, don't have any, uh, bad history in, in in the investment world or any world really. Okay. And what's shocking to me is, is they're so nitpicky. That I've submitted the the CPA supplied financials and and they're wanting the commas moved here and and uh, have a punctuation here. I never thought I'd pay that kind of money to have uh, an audit on the grammar. <laughs> sure. Sure. Wow. Well, that's, that's something interesting to know, especially if there's anybody out there who's listening, who've ever thought about doing this. Uh, mind your P's and Q's. He says, dot your T or dot your I's, cross your T's. Make sure that you got Grammarly on that contract. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. So I know you, you probably recall, I had what's called a registered investment advisory firm, which yes. is a highly regulated RIA practice in Austin that I sold. Sure. And, you know, it, the regulators have a space. There, there's a place for them. But in many cases, you know, it, it's an overreach, in my opinion. <laughs> but it's not of my control. I have no say over it. That's okay. yeah, out of these 47 different uh, different properties that you've owned, have any of them just been a humdinger with a cool story that you'd like to share? Whether it be good or bad. Whether it be good or bad. Because, look, in my history, man, I've had some, I've had some really good stories about some really bad events. I've had no losers. I've actually can honestly say that we we we've, we've never lost a, a dime on any of those forty seven properties. Excellent. Now I did have one that it took a ten years to break even, ah. and that was kind of an anomaly. I'll tell you about that. It's an apartment complex in uh, Bridge City, Orange County, Texas. Sure. Forty five days after we acquired it, got hit by Hurricane Ike, oh. and had four foot of water. This was 08, 2008. Of course, the economy took a dive. All the jobs left Port Arthur. So, you know, those things happen. Sure. Uh, but Life. There's, there's total, we were fully insured. You know, we came out okay, but it, it was a longer hold than than I sure. certainly intended. It wasn't 18 months. <laughs> no, I get, I get <laughs> what you're saying. Yeah. But it, it happened. 120 right. months. Right, right. But it happened. That's the thing. In the end, it made its way. It did it. You know, heck, that's that's better than a lot of folks can say. A whole lot of folks that I talk to in any real estate game says, oh, yeah, I've taken several losses before they ever even got a win. And uh, so that's that's good. You're you're doing well there. I can tell you another story. Uh, property in Lago Vista, Texas, just north of Austin on, on Lake Travis. Great community. Uh, it's booming out there. But, oh, and, you know, another thing I just thought of, I, meant, I wanted to mention is the, the valuations on real estate have just gone sky high in Texas. So we're at an all-time high in uh, assessed values. 
and the, the tax amount of dollars are are just climbing up and up and up. Sometimes people are, are paying more in taxes than they did when when they had a note uh, when they bought their home and they financed it. It's, taxes are, are high. And the reason in Texas we have high taxes is one of the reasons we don't have a state income tax. So a pretty big chunk of that burden is on property owners. So anyway, the property I bought in Lago Vista, I bought a lot for like, uh, it was about an acre, a little over an acre, a commercial lot, vacant lot, bought it for around $35,000. Um, ended up selling it to what now is, is on that lot is a fire station. So first, a first offer I had on it for 135,000 was for a post office in Lago Vista. The second offer which we ended up closing was a $185,000 paid 30 some thousand for it. And, uh, is now a, a fire station sitting on that property. Right. So see, you're not just over here selling or, you know, selling a piece of land that's going to turn into a house or something. No, you're over here dealing with something on a much different scale, dealing with real contracts, with real organizations that are going to pay, that are a little safer and a little bit more lucrative too. Wonderful. That's that's good news for the investors. That's for sure. That, that's great news for your investors. I love to hear that. Love to hear it. So, hey, tell me what it's like in Rockport. You, you said you're from Austin. You spent most of your time in Austin. What is it like there? You know, it, it, first of all, you said, how long have you been in Rockport? In July, will be three years. Now, before you went there, had you been frequenting that? Uh, I mean, because it's a different culture. It's a different culture. Now, I'd come to Port Aransas. You know, you can't live in San Antonio without knowing about Port A. Sure. So growing up, middle school, high school, Port A, which is just 30 miles, uh, less than 30 minutes, it's like 18 miles to the south of Rockport. You got to go over the ferry, so it takes about 30 minutes if you're not on a motorcycle because the motorcycles get to go to the front of the line. You don't have to wait. And right now with spring break going on, it's like an hour and 20 minute wait for the ferry. But Rockport, back to Rockport, this is a fishing, they call it, the locals call it a, a, a drinking town with a fishing problem. <laughs> okay, I like it. I like it's it. a number one fishing destination. You got a lot of arts. Uh, about 50% of the structures were demolished. Hurricane Harvey made landfall here in 2017, destroyed 50% of the structures. Wow. So we've got a new courthouse under construction, new city hall. Uh, it's a great place. The beach is phenomenal. Very clean beach for children. Um, we've got uh, bird sanctuary, bird lovers coming here. Uh, they love to come here, bird watchers. What I don't like about it is, well, I love no traffic. I can go anywhere in, in 10 minutes or less. I can get to Corpus in 35 minutes or so. But what, what, I, what I have a distaste for and unpleasant is the darn mosquitoes. It's just, <laughs> they're, they're, I, my wife has bought something to put over our windows, some extra screens to, on the car to Oh my God! The and the mosquitoes just swarm in there, so that's one of the drawbacks. The flat is so flat down here at the coast. I I miss the hill country in Austin. Sure. And my friends, but as far as uh, overall, I'm liking it here. It, it's really a great slower pace of life, and that's and, what I was getting at too. I know it's a different culture. It's a different style of living. And how was that adjusting from the hustle and bustle of Austin, right, the state capital? Uh, where you're at. I mean, it's kind of party USA as far as the city goes. Uh, and Freakville, uh, you know, Freakville, Texas. I mean, that's what it's known for is just its weirdness all the way around. Be whatever it is you want to be, however wild and flamboyant about it you want to be. And it's okay. And that, and that's fine. But now you went to a more rural area, you know, that, uh, that's a little bit more relaxed. The city's around uh, 11,000. Uh, the county's less than 20,000 people. Um, this week, we're probably at 20,000 people on the beach. Wow. So it's definitely a tourist destination. Sure. Um, the the Austin scene, you know, I loved it. 44 years I spent, raised my, my only child there. Sure. And I have a lot of friends in Austin, uh, but I just got tired of the, the, the growth, the traffic, and the amount of of uh left 
left and center politics. Sure. sure. You know, it's sure. just you needed you needed a little bit more freedom and you needed a, a slower uh, a slower place. That's all. It was time to calm down in life. Time to get out of that. Life, you're you're exactly right. No, I totally understand. I totally get it. Sometimes you get to, you know, and, and I think that that's natural because when we get to a certain age, there's a certain amount of we don't want that BS in our life. We want to handle our own stuff. At the same time, I do know that people of the you know a few decades younger. Uh, they actually do need that structure, I think, in order to stay okay. So yeah. I think there's just a time in life for it, and we just move through those phases. So you've totally. gone from needing to do the hustle bustle work thing to, you know, to the, the housing areas and everything else to now here you are being saying, no, I'm doing my own thing out here on the coast, out on the beach, baby. Yep. I, yep. I got a little golf cart. I get around town and. You don't spend a ton on gas. I just got back. I wanted to mention, I just got back from the National Tax Lien Association's annual conference in Miami. Ooh. Three days. I spent Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in Miami with about 125 leaders in the tax lien business. Okay. And only two of us from Texas. Really? Illinois, New York, Arizona. And the speakers were phenomenal. But I got reminded of the traffic in Miami. It's, it's, it's like Austin, San Antonio. Well, San Antonio is not like Houston, but, you know, it, the traffic there is terrible, Miami, just like Austin. Sure. However, I learned a lot. I'm so happy I went. There's a, there's a recent um, U.S. Supreme Court hearing related to tax liens. That's all in the media. It was a case in Minnesota where an elderly lady lost her home to uh, a tax sale and there was some overage and the state of Minnesota, like 11 other States, they keep the overage, which is rightfully belongs to the former owner in, in other States in Texas, for example, if there's a hundred thousand dollar property that had $10,000 worth of taxes and penalties, because the penalties sometimes are higher than the tax taxes sure. do, but someone bid that property up to 50,000, that's forty thousand dollars worth of surplus, what is technically called overage, and it it's it, it rightfully belongs to that prior owner. I see. However, they rarely know about it. Number one, right? But this this suit that just went to the Supreme Court in Minnesota said that overage goes to that lady, and this is having some major repercussions in states like New York, Colorado, where they've been keeping that overage. Sure treasures and it goes to the states and, and they're going to have to pay back lots and lots of years worth of money they they had uh, been spending <laughs> uh oh <laughs> and the problem with that is trying to find the rightful heirs i because see sometimes people that didn't pay their taxes either they can't be found they've deceased but there is a whole nother side of our business is is helping people that are entitled to that surplus money and matching them up and finding and every there's an heir it could be a a, a third distant cousin but sure. somebody in that property owner's family is in right to that have make a claim on that overage money i see i see but now how would somebody go about finding out like just random joe blow how would they go about finding out if they have overages owed to them in texas it's not easy uh, number one, they have to know that their their uh, relative owned the property in this certain county. Okay, so they have to know to look. Yeah, and 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 I was just looking at a case where I tried to find the owner. The owner was taken from a nursing home to a hospital in in 2018 and never came back to the nursing home. So most likely that person passed. Sure. They didn't, they didn't have a spouse and no children, but there are some distant, there, there's what's called intestate in Texas. There's somebody that's in that lineage. Sure. Either it's a in-law, outlaw, uh, cousin, yeah. nieces, nephew, somebody, if they can be found, they got rights to that money. Hey, if you're interested in a one-on-one -on -one business growth strategy consultation with me, uh, Fill out the form below and uh, let's set up a time to hop on a Zoom call and talk.
safer. Yeah, that's that's safer. safer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a whole another space where we're we're going to be uh, operating in in our business in what's called the surplus business, helping match people up and taking a a reasonable fee for doing all that work, finding them and, and helping them with the process of making the rightful claim on that money. Certainly, certainly. So, so I got to ask now that you've moved to Rockport and, and you got, you're living at party central USA. It sounds like, uh, what do you do with your time? What, how, how does John spend his leisurely hours? What is it that you do? Well, I ride a motorcycle. Love it. What do you ride? I got a 2015 Harley street glide. Cool. And, uh, I love to get out, you know, when, the, when it's pleasant in the morning or, you know, it's humid over here, you get in the afternoon and, you know, it, I'll still ride, but I don't, I don't like to ride in the heat of the day, but <laughs> I, do, I do that. Um, I like to just go to the beach and, uh, chillax, chillax. travel, uh, after our conference last week in Miami, we jumped on my wife and I a, a little short weekend cruise over to Bahamas. Nice. And, uh, left Friday at three o'clock. We were back Sunday morning. It's just, I mean, you're cruising. You're only in the Bahamas like seven hours. Sure, sure. They drop you off, let you get off and do your thing and get back on. Uh, yep. Yeah. Wait in line two hours to get on the darn ship and then wait another two hours in line to get off of it. So, sure. Wow. It takes the fun away, but to answer your question, I play a little golf, not not a whole lot. Uh, travel is, I've got this motor home, and we'll take little quick trips uh, in our motor coach. Love that. Love that. My wife and I discussed that here about a year ago, and we're really still looking at it, just going, look, we were going to do the whole Web3 gypsy lifestyle, man. Just get in a, yeah, get in a motor or, oh, yeah, a mobile home, or motor home and go across the country, stop wherever we want to for as long as we want to, run everything we do online and just be omnipresent, omniplatform, omnidimensional, you know, all the time from a, you know, from a, a mo mobile motor home. <laughs> That's what we did during COVID. Love we were it. in our own bed every night, didn't have to worry about bed bugs and COVID in the hotel rooms. Oh. It's so nice. I enjoy it. That's good to hear it. Good oh, to hear it, John. I've got to ask you, I've got to ask you if there are any words of wisdom that you would like to bestow upon our audience, what would they be? Number one is if you don't have a Roth IRA, get one today. Even if it's for a hundred bucks, the Roth IRA is the greatest gift Congress has ever given us. That's my word of advice as a retirement income planner. There you go. And how many years of experience do you have in this? 30, almost 40 years in retirement income planning, licensed in Texas. And if you're not aware of the benefit of the Roth, I use this kind of example. If you were a farmer, and would you rather pay your taxes on the amount of the seed you plant or on the entire harvest? Now, hopefully your answer is the seed. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that one little tiny seed, not all the grains that it makes. So the 401k, the regular IRA, all the pension, qualified retirement accounts, you get a, uh, a break, you get a deduction for contributing to those. But when you get to be my age or get to be over 59 and a half, where you start to take that money out, 100% of it's going to be taxable. Whereas with the Roth, if you've had it for five years, when you opened your first Roth, with even as little as $100, there's a five-year clock. So get that clock ticking so all the growth can come out income tax-free. In five years. Five years you can do that. Yep. Now, you can always take your basis, what you put in, because you didn't get a deduction. But okay. as long as you're over 59 and a half and you've had the Roth clock started for five years, there's no tax ever, ever, ever on your growth in your Roth IRA. And you can invest in real estate gold crypto you know roth you just can't have what's called self-dealing you can't buy an airbnb and stay in that airbnb i see you, you can't fix the real estate so it's it's if it's ideal for passive investments like our our project on the tax deeds sure makes sense makes sense okay now once again uh if someone was interested and they had now how, what amounts do you accept? I mean, I guess it's unlimited on the upside, right? You can take a million dollar, you know, uh, if you wanted to, 
what is your average? You said your goal is a thirty-five thousand. You're kind of what you're looking for from average Joe is, is around thirty-five thousand dollar investment. No, that thirty-five thousand was a target we 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 self-imposed to say, hey, if we don't raise at least thirty-five thousand, you're going to get your money back. I see. Okay, so that's like step one. It's like this is what we're pushing for, and once we hit here, yeah, we'll it's on like Donkey Kong. But uh, you know, until we get there, we'll get we're your money back. At, I think we're at twenty-eight thousand with three investors. Ooh. So the minimum's two thousand. We've had our lowest investor of the three so far that made a pledge. They haven't parted with their money. We haven't received it yet. Sure, is three thousand. But Great. ideally, you know, someone we're happy to take the two thousand dollar investor. No, all day long we like it. If ideally they come at the fifteen thousand dollar level, I think that's the sweet spot for a couple reasons. One, we give them additional interest bonus shares. Sure. Two, you can right now between now and April fifteenth, you can put in if you're over fifty, you can put in seventy five hundred dollars in a Roth IRA for twenty twenty three, and you can put in eight thousand dollars for a contribution to a Roth in 2024. Nice. So you can get to 15,000. I think that's kind of the sweet spot. Um, sure. Okay. That makes sense. So strategically, that would, that would be the most beneficial for somebody to come in at without it really hitting them. I got you. No, that's beautiful. That, that's what you want. If you're going to make an investment, you want to make it at that right point. You know, how much is the right amount to come in uh, so that it, so that I'm taxed the least or so that it costs me the least, I'm penalized the least so that I get the maximum benefit, whatever it happens to be with each one of these, you know, deals. So, all right, 15,000 is like the sweet spot or more. I mean, 15,000 or more. Our largest investor that came in on the management side is uh, at 75,000. So we'll see, maybe somebody's going to come in, some of the big boys will like the deal and come in and put a hundred thousand. That'll be great. But I Are they still at a 12% pref? Mm -hmm. Yep. Everything okay. is similar on the class A. I do want to make this big caveat disclaimer. It's not suitable if this is your, your short-term money, your emergency money. Do not invest in this deal. Uh, it has to be money that you're willing to risk. Right. And you, hopefully you don't lose it, but you got to be know that that's a, a, a possibility. Yeah, it's a possibility with any real investment. I mean, that that's really what it is. I mean, very few of them are actually as stable as you think they are, even the almighty dollar, huh? <laughs> a, yeah, one of our, our, the guy just invested today is a very young, 23 years old, put in 5,000, and he's discharging right now from the Navy, five years of Navy service. So that's all I know about him. But uh, I'm pretty, pretty excited he was able to save at least five thousand discretionary dollars from his five uh, five years in the Navy. Sure. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool, you know. And and I stressed to him. Actually, I talked to his mom more than him. I sure. said, "Be sure, you know, he's got other monies to, you know, start it whatever he's going to do in his after Navy career." Sure, sure. But he but you got him started and going. Young guy, military, yeah. love it. Love it, love it. And so now, and that's growing. That's early. He's just now discharging from the military. He's got his whole life ahead of him to build this and grow this and uh, and use it <laughs> and use it. That's the yeah. idea. And, and and buy another one. <laughs> right. Right now, yeah. how many IRAs could a person have simultaneously? No limit. Really, really. That's okay. Not aware of. I'm not aware of any. Now, what's real popular is doing Roth conversions. They the government limits how much you can contribute to a Roth. Remember I said the 7,500? If you're under 50, you can only put in 7,000. But there's no limit. If you have uh, $100,000 in an IRA, you can convert to a Roth. You may or may not want to because you're you're triggering a taxable event. Sure. But the strategy is pay the taxes now right. and who knows what tax is going to be next. Right now, we're in the lowest tax environment in my lifetime. Sure. And they're going to sunset in 2025. The current tax brackets are going to go back to what they were before 2017, and they're they're going to go up. And they're probably going to go up even higher with the 40, I'm sorry, 30, what is it, $35 trillion deficit sure. we have going on. <laughs> so tax planning is, is very important, and that would be my second tip after the Roth IRA is do some tax planning. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, I've got to ask you, since you're in real estate and this is what you do is the hunt and the deal and everything else, what is your prediction over the next 20, you know, 12 to 24 months for the real estate market? I hear a lot of conflicting uh, information. Well, I'm of the school that there's going to be a major, major, there is already a major correction in commercial office space, multifamily, even single family. Austin had a huge run up, you know, number one, and now they're down like 14% from a year ago. Even Port Aransas, I just saw they're down 28% year over year from February residential to February of 24. So I'm of the camp that we haven't seen nothing yet. Which sure. interest rate so YouTube analytics tells me that 86% of you guys are not subscribed. Let's change that. Hit the button. A lot of these commercial loans are balloons. So when you buy multifamily, and that's been all the rage for investors over the last six, seven, eight years, multifamily, multifamily, multifamily. Yep. And it's good. The rent's been going up. People have been doing all right. But now that the, if they were leveraged, and are, they always leverage, for the most part, 70 or 80% debt, and those rates are going to double when that balloon hits in three to five-year balloon. So they're not 20-year fixed rates, 30-year fixed rates. So I think the multifamily is going to see a huge, and it's already seen a big correction. Of course, the um, the election, the wars going on, inflation, I think it's going to get ugly this year. And then uh, somewhere we'll find the bottom and start to rebound again. Now, are you of the philosophy that it's on the way down? Buy while blood's in the street. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd sit tight. I don't think it's time to it buy. Died, let it dip. Huh? Let it hit the dip. Mm -hmm. We ain't there yet. We ain't there yet. Wait. <laughs> that's my. That's what I believe. But, I could be but wrong. You do believe in pulling the trigger when it hits that bottom. Yeah, we're buying stuff in this tax deed business at 30 cents on the dollar, sometimes less, sometimes a little more. Sure. But, you know, when, the key is I think you make your money when you buy it right. You that, don't overpay it. on, on the interest that's right. side. That's well, You always make your money on the buy. No matter what it is, it's always on the buy, man. Uh, so, okay, so how is how is the future of, of the market going to affect what you do? Is it going to help it or hinder it? Is it going to stay the same? I mean, uh, you're, you're looking for certain types of investments. So how does that work yeah. for you? Well, think about it. With the uh, inflation and the effect on the average person, they're getting behind more, they're living more, credit card debt right now than ever. We're at all time highs in credit card debt. There's more tax foreclosures going on than ever before nationwide. So there's going to be more inventory. There'll be less capital at the sales. So less competition for us. Tax values, there's a there's a lag of two to three years before these appraisal districts lower those tax values to to reflect the market decline. Sure. So, I think it, all the stars are lining up for a great time to be in the tax deed business here in Texas. It sure and sounds like it is. It sounds like it is. Our project is available to, you don't even have to be a U.S. citizen. You can be a can, Canadian, uh, all anywhere in the world, they can invest in our crowdfunding offering. So people want, people in Michigan, uh, Canada, who know, anywhere, the Philippines, if they want to own some Texas real estate on a passive basis without getting their hands dirty and risking the arm and the leg, our project is worth them taking a look at. It, it sure sounds like. Now, uh, how can they get a hold of you, John? Either email, text, or uh, phone call, 512-431-0802, text or phone. And then uh, my email is, is going to be on this here, John, at coretaxdeeds.com. Excellent. Yes. And they'll also flash on the screen as well. I'll do all that for you when we, when, you know, we would put this together. So, uh, well, I thank you very much for your time, John. I think we've heard, you know, what it is that you do, how your fund works, uh, how we can get into it. Uh, we, we know what the minimal investment is. We understand the upside on it, uh, the potential. Uh, now let me just make sure for everyone out there who may be you know, just getting into watching it later in the video or not watched all the whole thing to hear the deal. Let's do a recap. So your fund uh, goes in and purchases tax deeds right at a discount, roughly 30 cents on the dollars, like what your goal is. 
and uh, you were looking for investment, a minimum of $2,000 per person on up, right, for a 12% preferential return, which means that their 12% gets paid before anything else gets paid. Therefore, uh, after that's done, up to being paid in full, there's a 60-40 split. Is that correct? Where the investors get 60% or, uh, of the every time we distribute. And Correct. then after you're paid off, it goes down to a 50%. So even after they're paid back, they're still receiving a distribution of 50% of the profits of what you're doing every quarter. Correct. You got okay. it. I wanted to make sure I did. Hey, that's why I asked the questions. When I can do that recap and make it simple for anybody mm -hmm. to understand, uh, $2,000 and up. That's it. $2,000 and up. The sweet spot's 15. If you got 15 grand sitting in a... Uh, sitting in a rod, sitting in an IRA, sitting in a self-directed IRA, sitting in a 401k, sitting in somewhere where you need to stick it. Hey, uh, they've got a place for you with a 12% preferential return, right? Estimated yep. break even around 18 months once they're funded. Now, what does that mean? That means if you want to get it faster, help fund them faster. I mean, that, that's all you can do. You help fund it faster if you want it to start faster. That's, that's the rule, the, the way it works uh, out here in the rules of money, man. I mean, you can't buy something unless you got the money to do it. So, uh, you know, one, one quick disclosure, disclaimer, uh, we cannot accept any money right now. We are under what's called test the water stage. We've been with our legal team has been engaged for nearly five months, getting all the, our, our legal documents in order to file this regulation crowdfunding offering. And we, you can make a pledge, a non-binding pledge at this point, just express some interest. However, until we file the Form C, which is much like a private placement memorandum and a 506 offering, we're not allowed to accept or even advertise uh, the the program, which I, I got to be sure we got this disclaimer on here that sure. this is not an offer. You cannot invest right now and, and, and you need to do your diligence. Right. But they can it's express fine. interest. They can Correct. express interest if they've heard something that they liked here. Uh, this is the information that they would hear if they were to call you, right? Everything that you said. So yeah. what they could do, what they could do is take that knowledge and information and understand it as, you know, for what it is. And then mm -hmm. say, hey, I'm ready to make a soft commitment to help you get going. Uh, yeah. If they really see value in it, that that's what does it is signing the piece of paper. So kind of like names on a petition. Everybody likes the idea, but until you get the names on the paper, it doesn't mean anything. So you got to get the names on the paper. Uh, anybody out there that likes what they're hearing and they think that they would like to get in to something like this, uh, one way to do it is to contact John and uh, make that soft commitment that's non-binding, right? Because there's no money exchanged, none of that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, help help a project move along, <laughs> help a business build. That's exactly what it is. And then, you know, one day reap the returns of a real investor. Bingo. You got it. Excellent. Thanks for enjoyed uh, having another meeting with you. It's always fun to get to know you a little better and share what we're doing. I love to come back on someday when when we get a little further down the road and share some of our results. You got it. As a matter of fact, once the fund is closed, I would like to talk about that. I would like to talk about the raise process and how that went. You know what? You can't talk about it till it's closed. I understand, right? And even before the build goes, before development goes in and everything else that happens with a lot of the stuff that you do, or you start going out and buying them with the fund, uh, let's hear from day one. It's like, all right, we're now funded. This is what we're doing. And I would love to hear that from you, John. Love to. So, hey, it's been great catching up with you. I appreciate you being here with our audience today. Uh, now, one more time, you're looking for a fractional CFO to join your team. That's what you're looking for. That's the number one a uh, business person that you could be connected with right now is a person that would be willing to be a fractional CFO, part-time overseer of your, of your finances to be able to help you guys out and do what you do. Okay. Now, uh, secondly, you're looking for, uh, you're looking for investors, people who are serious about making a soft commitment. They're serious about a soft commitment on making something happen. So, all right. Thank you very much for your time, John. I hope everybody out there has got the information that they needed. Uh, uh, are there any words, any things, any sentiments that you would like to express that you have not had the opportunity to at this point? Yeah, I want to extend another invitation to you, Christopher, to get down here to Rockport and let's have a, a, a meeting and let me give you a quick tour of this area.
Hey, we'll do it. We'll do it. Uh, you know what? It's coming up spring. It's springtime now. It's springtime and summertime. Look, me and my wife, uh, me and my wife like to travel too. It ain't even a couple hours down the road. Uh, we'll make that happen. Hit me up on the back end. We'll schedule something up for one of these weekends. We'll drive on down and, and say hello. Sounds good. But the weekdays are less congested. Well, you know what? I prefer that too, man. But it always makes me sound like an old dude. So I don't tell everybody that. So, <laughs> hey, I tell you what, you schedule me for a Tuesday afternoon and we're great. All right. Well, <laughs> hey, John, I'll tell you, you have yourself a good day. Thank you for speaking with us and uh, being a guest on the Network of Network right. video podcast and uh, for sharing not only uh, the opportunity with everyone, but sharing what it is that you do in life and who you are as a person. Uh, we really appreciate that. The main focus of this show is not only about the opportunities, but to let people know what it's like to be a human being in these particular fields of industry. You know, you're an investment fund manager and to a lot of people, that's a foreign entity. That's something that they don't even know what that means. What's that? And what is this? What does a conversation with an investment fund manager even sound like to some people? They don't know. They've never heard the language before. Uh, you being on this show educates a lot of people. And I believe that this form of media coming live, having real conversations and then making them public to the world, uh, it will educate people in a way that they weren't privy to in, in the past you know when you had to sit back in the shadows and wonder what it looked like to be a fly on the wall well yeah. you get to be a fly on the wall you and i've just been speaking for an hour and 10 minutes uh, about investment funds about real estate about the state of the market uh, about how people can join an opportunity what it takes about to do about it the economy and about taxes and everything taxes. everything and these are the types of conversations that people like us have. And it's not a weird conversation. It's not odd. It's not anything. And I think it's important for the public to see these types of things. So thank you for your contribution, John. You have well, a fantastic rest of your evening. You too. And best wishes with your program. Yes, sir. Have a good day. Uh -huh. Bye-bye. Hey, if you are a business owner, an investor, or a leader in your industry, and you would like to have your story told, if you would like to share your story with our audience, be a guest on our video podcast. There's a link down below. I'd love to have a conversation with you. The Network of Net Worth Video Podcast is a place where we have high-level conversations with high-level individuals, and I'd like for you to be one of those individuals. Hit the link below.